Excellent. Excellent, excellent, excellent. All right. So yeah, I'm going to get started. I think we'll have a few more people coming in. Um, so um, my name is Ife Tayo Walker. I am the Associate Director for Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion for Mills College at Northeastern University in Oakland, California. And I am honored to welcome you to our second um, genealogy workshop series. Uh, our first series last month um, featuring Nika Sewell Smith, focused on beginning genealogy. And uh, a little later in this, in this presentation, you will get an opportunity to, to access that link if you haven't already seen it, either because you were there or um, you haven't had a chance to receive the link for the first one. It is available online. And today we are going to pick up that conversation. Um, honored again to start talking about um, the impact and how we can research through the enslavement era or the enslavement experience for um, many of our uh, ancestors. And for those that have already started doing their research or for those who, for whom this is their first workshop, we hope that you will get some amazing information and that you will feel inspired. Um, I'm gonna pass it over to Dr. Ashley Adams shortly, but I would like to just take a moment to mark this experience. Um, many of us are doing our own research, researching our family history, looking into our genealogy, because we want to honor our ancestors. We wanna know more about them. We want them to come alive for us in some way. We want to learn more stories of who they were, where they came from. And uh, that is part of what we're doing here. So um, what I'm gonna do is pour a very quick libation and then we're gonna move on. It is 535, this is gonna be very quick. Um, what I'm gonna do is simply um, ask you to, as we're joining together in community, begin to hold the names, the, the faces that you remember, um, the stories that you remember of any of the ancestors in your line, ancestors who were close to you, who were meaningful for you, hold that information, hold their images in your heart and in your mind's eye. And um, as I pour a little bit of libation, some water into a plant, I'm going to ask you to, in the chat, if you'd like to lift anyone up. Um, in this experience and let them know that we are thinking about them. This is that time to do it. Just feel free to type names in the chat as I begin to pour a little libation. I have my lovely plant and I have some water and I'm going to ask that our ancestors that are with us, that they bless this gathering, that they bless those of us that are sitting here in front of their computer screens, ready to learn how to honor them further, how to have them be remembered. Uh, for many of us, we have ancestors whose name we don't know, but just because we don't know your name doesn't mean that you weren't real and that your lives were not important. So uh, I would like all of the spirits of those people that are with us in our families, whether we know their names or not, to join us and be with us. And um, so I'm going to call on a few names and I'm just going to say Ashe and I'm going to ask you to continue to write the names of your ancestors. And um, you don't have to unmute, but you can just say Ashe to yourselves. Um, I'm going to call on a few of my family members, uh, my mother, Beverly Ann Io Pierce, my father, Lawrence Pierce, and I'm going to say Ashe, which is a word we use to punctuate the prayer for our ancestors. It comes from um, the Yoruba language. It means kind of like amen or so be it, let it be so, let it be powerful. Um, I would like to call on those ancestors that we know were here, not by their own choosing that could remember where they came from, could remember where they started and who made it to these shores. And I would like to call on those ancestors and tell them that thank you for persevering. We understand that that was painful. We understand that that was the worst kind of trauma, but we are so thankful that you were there and that you persevered. So I'm gonna call on those names and say Ashe. I'm going to call on the names of, on, on the ancestors who survived the enslavement experience, but also those ancestors who didn't, who because they fought or because they attempted to speak up for themselves. I want them to know that we are ready to speak for them and that we're speaking up for them. So I'm going to say Ashe for them. Um, I'm going to 
want to remember the names and the spirits of those ancestors who made it through the enslavement experience, um, became free, um, whatever that meant for them, and survived through all these other experiences in their lives, were able to teach and preach and serve and fight. And we call on those ancestors as we say, Ashe. And please, I ask you to continue putting names in the chat for any of those ancestors, whether you know their names or not, um, because they are remembered, they were important. Um, and we do much of what we do in this reparation struggle for them. They need to know we are working on their behalf as well as our own. Um, and I'm not gonna ask you to stop putting names in as they come to you, even if it's 20 minutes from now. If there's a name that you would like to lift up, please feel free to do that. But I'm gonna close this um, brief libation by saying Ashe three times, and then I will pass it on to Dr. Adams. Ashe, Ashe, Ashe. Thank you. Thank you, Ife, yeah, you, everybody. Um, welcome, everyone. Good evening to you all. My name is Dr. Ashley Adams, and I am the director of the Black Reparations Project at Mills College at Northeastern University in Oakland, California. We are dedicated to promoting education and research on Black reparations policies, creating spaces for dialogue and learning, and providing technical assistance for reparative action. As a fourth generation descendant, formerly enslaved people who helped settle the historic Black town of Nicodemus, Kansas, and of ancestors who endured the Tulsa Race Massacre. I am honored to be here with you all tonight. As president of the Nicodemus Historical Society Board, I am deeply committed to preserving and celebrating our ancestors' legacies. I welcome everyone joining us tonight. Um, those of you who are from descendant communities, I encourage you to use the chat. Some of you already have to share um, here uh, what descendant community you are representing. Our time together in this genealogy workshop series is about much more than tracing family lines. It's about centering our community wellness. It's about cultivating resilience and finding strength and clarity in our roots. Genealogy offers us perspective, healing, hope, and especially during these times when our country feels more divided. This work that we're doing together, although it may feel small, it is mighty. It reinforces community wellness and connection and reminds us of our shared purpose in history. As we engage in this genealogy journey tonight, I want to acknowledge that many of us are not okay right now. It's been a long week since last Tuesday, and it has been a very long and emotional experience. Um, in response to all the things, I want to acknowledge that learning about our ancestry is in many ways an act of resistance, a stand against erasure and a reaffirmation of our presence and our value in this country. As we reflect on our roots, we're not only honoring our ancestors, but also contributing to our collective strength and resilience. With that being said, in alignment with the guiding principles for the Black Reparations Project, I want to ask you all to join me in sharing our three core values. The first one, and these are mentioned in our first series too, is cultivating joy. The second is making healing a priority, which you heard me say healing a lot when I talk about genealogy research because it can be a healing experience. And the third is lever leveraging the transformative power of love as we explore genealogy and its connection to reparative justice and community wellness. I would also like to extend our sincere, um, sincere thanks to all of our sponsors that are listed on our website, whose generous support has made this event um, series possible. And a special thanks to the Mills College at Northeastern University Dean's Office, um, and to Umoya G and Kim M, who are both here joining us tonight with the MN, the Mass Media Group, for their technical support. Kim is also going to be serving as our moderator this evening. 
Finally, I want to uplift our esteemed speaker, Nika Smith, who is a genealogist, a documentarian, and a host with over 20 years of experience. And her work has transformed our understanding of ancestral connections. She specializes in researching enslaved communities and has been featured on major platforms such as Today, Good Morning America, CNN, MSNBC, National Geographic, Time, USA Today, and the New York Times. She is an inspiring leader in the descendant community movement and has, is serving on various boards and um, also serves as a family historian with lots of folks across the nation. And so Nika, thank you for being with us again tonight and for your dedication to honoring our ancestors. We are so grateful to have you to lead us through another session tonight. And I will now pass on the virtual mic to you as we continue to move through this journey. Welcome everybody. Thank you, Ife, and thank you, Dr. Adams, for being here this evening. Um, yes, we are in a quite momentous time, but one of the things that I'm acutely aware of, especially as you do more and more research on your family history, is that history is like a CD or like a singular album. You will hear the same track multiple times. Sometimes somebody may even do a rendition of the same song, but it's the same song. Um, and you've already lived through this. So if you needed a little bit of encouragement, you may not have seen it with your own eyes, but the cells within your body have seen the time such as this. So uh, I will also add, as I mentioned to the folks that were here uh, before we started, those of you who have been trudging um, along this journey for a long time and expected a different outcome, take the cape off and make it a blanket. All right. With that said, let's get started. I have a ton of information to share with you tonight, okay? And um, just so you're aware, there is a handout, a corresponding handout. So because I'm in some ways going to be water hosing you, do not feel like you have to try to take copious notes because I'm gonna be sharing a lot. Um, but again, before we get into tracing enslaved ancestors, there are certain questions that you need to ask. And the frame of mind that I have with this particular presentation is that you have already started the basics, okay? You are already there. You have already done the beginning portion of uh, your genealogy research. That is, for this presentation is not going to cover that because in order for us to properly deal with records of the enslaved and to deal with them in a way that can get you to information may perhaps quickly, you cannot be a beginner. So with that said, if you know you have not taken the first session, you may wanna watch the recording of this, go watch that session and come back and watch this one because otherwise there are gonna be terms, things that I'm going to say that are going to fly over your head. And really in the first two slides, you are going to feel like you're overwhelmed. And I don't want you to feel that way. I want you to get all the information that you possibly can. So with that said, we're making an assumption that you have begun the process of genealogy. You've traced from you going back to your respective ancestors as far back as you can go based off of your family's memory and based off of records, okay? We're not jumping. We are not trying to be related to Quincy Jones because our aunt said so, and we're skipping several generations and, and not looking at the evidence. We're not at that stage. We're literally going by what the oral history is and what the records say, okay? So in order for us to address the enslaved in our lineage, have you traced your family from present back to 1870? That's the first question. Why? Because 1870 is the first census that all black folks in the United States in theory, because you got to remember some people weren't on 1870, but it's the best chance that we have. Your ancestors who were formerly enslaved, that's the first census that they are going to be named on. That's why we want to get back to 1870. So the first question is, have you traced your family from present back to 1870? From there, have you confirmed that your ancestors were enslaved or free? And some of you might be sitting here watching, well, I came to find out how to trace slaves. Why are you talking about free people of color? 10% of the population of black folks living in the United States prior to uh, slavery ending were free. So if there were 4 million enslaved people, there were 400,000 free people of color. How do you know that? Well, when you start going back, 
doing the, the right way through genealogy, tracing from you going back through the generations, you are going to hit the 1860 census in the United States. You're going to know that those folks are your ancestors. Their race is going to be marked as mulatto or black. They're going to be in the right geographic location. The family groups are going to match. All that information is there. If you find them on the U.S. Census in 1860 and 1850, those people are free. If they are Black, they are living in the United States. Some of us think, oh, well, all of my people were enslaved. I haven't, you know, I haven't heard of any free people of color. So we don't even think about going to a census prior to that. But some people spin their wheels looking for enslaved people and they descend from free people of color. So that's another question to ask. Third, what oral history do you have about your ancestors? And if you were doing the genealogy and the steps that you're supposed to, you would have had initial conversations where you ask these questions. A lot of families, they may not necessarily have the name of the slaveholder, but they may know the land that their family lived on right after freedom happened. Or they may have a oral history. For instance, one of my aunts told me when I asked her the question, where was our family enslaved? And she said, we bought the land. And at first I thought she had lost her mind and gone crazy and see now because she was old. Because I'm like, that, listen, I've already researched your dad's land, his, his 160 acres. I know who those slaveholders were and those weren't our ancestor slaveholders. So what is she saying when she's saying we bought the land? She was not wrong. Her uncle bought the land. I qualified we as in her immediate family. No, she's talking about our family at large, her great uncle bought the land that our family was enslaved on. So think about your oral history, but your sole goal is to try to get as close to 1870 as possible. That should be goal number one. And then from there, when you have no other clues as to who a potential slaveholder is, that's when we get into the form that I'm gonna be talking about tonight. So in the process of identifying slaveholders, there is a certain level of, of information and knowledge that you have to have going into this process. And some of this is probably going to frustrate a number of you because you're you're going to think that it should be easier than this. But this is the landscape of where we are right now, even with great innovations such as full text search and AI. OK, even with even with that, we still have a lot of challenges that we have to overcome. What are some of the issues? Obviously, it's access is number one, getting to the actual records. Some people don't have the oral history like I had where the aunt said, we bought the plantation. Some of us have nothing, absolutely nothing. We don't even have grandparents, aunts, uncles, nothing, nobody. There's no one we could ask. We don't even know the county that our families were from before they great migration to the same, to the place that we're living in now. Or we, we just know a state, but we don't know the exact place. That's an uh, issue. Then for some of us, there's a lack of solid leads based on that 1870 census, right? So let's say you do find your folks on 1870, but there's there's nothing that's screaming out to you that these are your ancestors. For instance, um, some people may look for white families that have the same last name as their family in the exact same county. That's not foolproof because that could be a white family that came down during Reconstruction. Your family enslaved, last name that you have, that could be two or three slaveholders before the last one. If you're male, your last name could come from your mother's side of the family. So using last names is not always foolproof. Then even if, let's say you find them on 1870 and you try to go to the 1860 or 1850 slave schedules and you do the last name thing, that's not foolproof because if you were here last time, the slave schedule says blank lines. We don't have names for who those people are. So how do we know that those are the correct people? That's not foolproof. Then you, then once you can actually get to records, the, the lack of pre proper record keeping across slavery transactions, you all, it's one of the reasons why it's so hard to innovate in this space is because every set of records is different. Where I have one list that has names and ages and occupations, I have another one that just has names. What if that slaveholder has two men named William? How do I know which William is which? If one list has ages and the other one doesn't. If you know anything about tech and, and technology, those are two, you could create two tables for those things, try to make them talk, but you can't reconcile anything other than location and the slaveholder. 
because there could be three people with the same name and the the the, the records they they differ. They're not the same. And here's the thing. It's not even just from state to state. It could be from county to county. The record keeping was different. Then once we get past, maybe we don't have good leads for 1870 to jump back to the 1850 or 1860 slave schedules. We talk about record keeping not being consistent across the board. Then it's just, can I even get to the records? One of the states that I research is Louisiana. And in researching Louisiana, when I'm looking for stuff like probates or what we call successions, I have to use ancestry in order for me to access them. Because if I try to use family search, they're locked from my home. I can't view them. So then that also means that I have to have a subscription that I'm paying for or access it through the library, right? There's still microfilm, but who's ordering that? People are trying to access this stuff at home in a digitized format. So even if you use things like the full text search at Family Search, which is where they ran AI against all their digitized images and did text transcriptions, right? So they read the handwriting and made it made it a text transcription. Even with that and having access to that at home for wills and probates, it is of no consequence to me because the, the wills and probates for Louisiana are locked from my home. So the only way I have access to them is through a subscription with Ancestry. That's one scenario in one state, but it's extremely prevalent. Then once we get to the digitized images, we then have to deal with them being indexed, right? Because otherwise they're just in a photo. That's it. It's not like you can, you know, you can go on the photos app on your iPhone and search for words that are in pictures that you have. Like maybe yellow, you can search for yellow. So it brings up all the yellow yellow things in your 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 photos. Or maybe you search for uh, the name of a city and that pops up. No, with historical records, somebody has got to go in there, determine which fields or which set of information is the most important, which can include names and dates and locations. And that has to be transcribed by humans or in some instances, computers. And then if it's put online, I have to be able to find it. It has to be discoverable. That's a whole additional process. And it's not all done. You'll see when we start going through some of these records, because with this presentation, I'm giving you guys sort of a cheat code on how to get to this information faster. Because I was not one of those people where I had this long history of enslavement laid out before me because somebody had traced the, traced the family history. No, the, the, the history of enslaved folks in my family, I found it. Nobody left that for me. I didn't have any, I'm telling y'all, all the stuff that people try, would look for the white family with the same last name, look for the closest white family to your family on 1870, none of that stuff worked for me. That's how we get to this presentation is because these are the things that worked for me. And I know if I'm the worst case scenario, this can be applied to everybody else. So let's talk about why these records are important because for some of you, when you see the first name of an enslaved person, it is going to throw you emotionally and you need to be prepared for that. For others, you also have to consider that you may be the person in your family who has the muscle that can be exercised in a way that you can encounter this information and you can work through it. But for some people, it's gonna be too much and you either have to push through or you have to buddy up with somebody who can help you. So when we're talking about records of the enslaved, what we're talking about with the records that we're going to be spending our time on tonight is you're getting direct proof of enslavement. What do I mean by that? We're not looking at a blank line on the slave schedules and I'm pointing it to you and I'm telling you that's your ancestor. With the records that I'm talking about, it is going to say uh, John, Negro man, enslaved by so-and-so. Or it's going to have a first name and a last name and an age that matches. And and it, it's not a it's not a this could be somebody else. What we're talking about is direct proof. The other thing is you'll also get a timeline of when someone enslaved someone. There's the thought process that we have that our ancestors only came from one place in Africa, which is not true. They were taken from a multitude of places. And likewise, when you're talking about slave owners, your ancestors likely didn't have just one slaveholder. Now they may have passed down through a singular family, 
But those people have different names, which means that those are different people. They could be mortgaged by different folks. They could be sold off by different folks. So when you're getting direct proof of your ancestors and slaver, again, it's super important for you to have a timeline so you know who's at play and when your ancestor was moved here, here, there, and everywhere. The other thing is with these records, they also can give you the date of manumission or self-emancipation. What does that mean? A manumission is a private act where a slaveholder frees their enslaved either in their will or they could go and go to the clerk of court office and report and say, I'm hereby freeing this enslaved person or the individual could have self-emancipated. They could have, quote, run away. You can get a date or a ballpark figure for what that is. All right, more. We also, and this is the most important thing, we get a bird's eye view into what was going on in this country during enslavement, during the Civil War, and right thereafter. And the most important aspect of this is when folks try to argue you down about what was happening, you can speak from your chest about what your family's experience was and who survived these things. You have a full context that most Americans do not have. In fact, I, I will go out on a limb and say that you may have a context that these slaveholding families' descendants don't have because they haven't gone to look into the records. And if they have, there's a possibility that when they encountered that enslaved person, they turned in the opposite direction and went somewhere else. You gotta be prepared for that part. The other thing is we have an opportunity to elevate the personhood of these people. As we carve out our trees, as we build them out, as we connect the records to them, we are reminding the world and their descendants that they were human, that they lived, and that they have descendants, right? So it's, it's, it's a multiple step process. And with the record sets we're going to be talking about, they work independently to, you know, validate a slaveholder or give you the name of a slaveholder, or they work together. There are examples that I'm gonna show you where you're gonna see records in all three collections. There are some where you're gonna see them in two, there are some you're gonna see them in one where it's just very straightforward. This is who the slaveholder was. All right, so let's talk about the three collections. The first is dealing with United States color troops, which is important, especially considering that we are on the cusp of the 160th anniversary of the end of the Civil War in 2025. Why is this important? More than 180,000 Black men fought on the side of the Union. And the statistics are that one in three of your ancestors was involved in the Civil War as a U.S. color troop. And the reason why I'm bringing this to you is with numbers that high, an easy way to get to your, your slaveholder is through the records of the U.S. color troops. Now, the reason you'll see I have green shaded uh, boxes on this slide, pay attention to those states because you may see multiple of them, or you may see it in multiple areas, okay? So when we're talking about enlistment, men who enlisted to be a part of the US color troops, and we're not even qualifying the women who served as nurses, maids, and matrons who also have records um, for the Civil War time period, but Louisiana, had 24,000 U.S. color troops. And you have to remember, I just told you there were only four, 400,000 free people of color. Where were they getting 180,000 U.S. color troops? All those people were not free. The majority of them were enslaved. You don't get that without the Militia Act. You don't get that without the Confiscation Act, right? Those are all, all, all acts that had to be passed by, by, by Congress. So you've got Louisiana with 24,000 plus U.S. colored troops. Kentucky had 23,000. Tennessee had 20,000. And then from there, it goes Maryland, Pennsylvania, and Missouri. But if you are researching in Louisiana, Kentucky, and Tennessee, you are going to hit a U.S. color troop. It's almost impossible that you do not. And it may not necessarily be your direct ancestor. It may be an uncle or it may be uh, someone married into your family. And when you pull their pension, you see the interviews from folks in your family and you see them confirming who their slaveholder was in their own words. Now, when we're talking about the Freedmen's Bureau, we're going to go over the history of all of this stuff. But I'm just showing you at a glance, you're going to see some states that are going to be repeated in this. 
There's Louisiana again, Freedmen's Bureau. We're going to talk about when it was founded, what kind of records they have. But if we're talking about the prevalence of certain states within the Bureau records, Virginia has the most records in the Bureau, followed by Louisiana. You see that is twice. There's a top for U.S. color troops recruitment or uh, a USCT's second in Freedmen's Bureau records, followed by uh, Georgia, South Carolina, Kentucky again, Kentucky's second in enlistment. And then it's in the top, what, six in the Freedmen's Bureau, North Carolina. When we start talking about probates and successions, again, someone passes away, their property passes to their descendants or whoever they decide. When you're talking about record counts and the number of records that exist for probates in respective states that are online, you see several northern states on this at the top, but North Carolina and Missouri have a lot of records that are online with regard to probates. So again, if you are researching any state that is in green in any of these record sets, you are doing yourself a disservice trying to find your ancestor slaveholder and not deciding to go into these record collections. All right, so now that we've got that squared away, we have to talk about the background of each of these collections and how you can get to the information. That'll be right after this, but we have to know the background of what we're looking at. So. When we're talking about Civil War veterans, right, we talked about 180,000 Black men who enlisted to fight as a part of the Civil War, okay? Um, we, have to, we have to qualify it. Civil War pensions are the same as what people would consider to be on 50% disability today, right, from the VA. You ask somebody who's a veteran, I'm on 100%, I'm on 75%. It's the exact same thing. Um, it's just regarding the Civil War, okay? Now, here is information from the African American Civil War Museum. They say, of course, the United States Colored Troops made up over 10% of the Union Army and 25% of the Union Navy. There's, there were more Black men in the Navy during the Civil War. And with regard to that, um, even though the U.S. color troops were prohibited from joining until July of 1862. That was 15 months into the war. Again, they were only made up of 1% of the Northern population of Black people. So the majority of these people were enslaved, you all. And the way that I look at it is it was the one of the biggest fugitive slave operations in, the, in, in history. Basically what, what was done with the Militia Act and the Confiscation Act. Um, and so, um, with that said, when you're getting a pension, and again, we're talking about it from the vantage point of the union, we are not talking about the Confederacy yet, because I have some myths to dispel there. When a person got a pension, it was for their support, war support service in the army or navy, um, and it was issued for select family members as well as a veteran. So let's say the veteran passes away, their widow could get their pension. While they're still alive, they can get a pension. Their minor children can get a pension as well as their mother. And I've even seen fathers get a pension. How did a mom or dad get it? Because their child passed away and they had no next of kin. And they had no way of taking care of themselves. They'll also get their bounty, which is basically the equivalent of like a sign-on bonus would go to those uh, dependents as well. Now, here's how much money we're talking about with these. In 1866, the federal government spent 15.9 million on veterans benefits. By 1893, they were spending $165 million. And that was directly correlated with the expansion of the number of veterans eligible for benefits. Why? Because people weren't all dying on the battlefield. They had advanced medical, uh, uh, better advanced medical and medicine situations going on, right? So folks were, and folks were living longer. So that's another reason why. Now, when we start talking about Confederates, please do not believe the hype. There are folks, and I will tell y'all are going to see it on social media. Oh, look at this picture, this black man, he fought for the Confederacy. Listen, by the time the Confederates decided to give black men guns, it was too late. It was done. They had lost. Anyone that is serving is typically a body servant, meaning their slaveholder went to war and they came with them. It's like they brought Benson on the on the battlefield, if y'all remember Benson. Jeffrey, 
from Fresh Prince of Bel Air. Don't that just sound so crass? But they did. That's what they did. Okay. Now, Confederate pensions, those were issued for service to veterans of the Confederate Army in a few instances, war service, right? So these are these body servants. This is them getting a pension. Um, but here's the thing. A relatively small number of former camp slaves, meaning body servants, took advantage of state pensions. Confederate pensions were issued by states. The U.S. color troop pensions were issued by the federal government. Two completely different things. OK, so if you're trying to access a Civil War pension of a Confederate body servant, there are very few. And even with that, they're mostly in states like Mississippi, South Carolina, Tennessee, Virginia and North Carolina. Remember, U.S. color troops, federal Confederacy is at the state, which also means because it's issued by the state, the records are going to be held by the state. Same thing with the uh, federal pensions, right? They're going to be records are going to be kept by the federal government, not by the state. Now, what is some of the direct evidence that you can get in these pensions regarding enslavement? You you're going to get statements in these pensions from the veterans. So if you ever wanted to hear the words of your ancestor, this is probably one of the number one collections where you can do that outside of the slave narratives. Slave narratives, obviously, was interviews that were done by the WPA in the 1930s. It spans the United States. But here's the thing. There were well, way, way, way more Civil War pensions than there were slave narratives, just based off of the sheer number of U.S. color troops. And in addition to getting statements or depositions from the veterans, their family members, people they were in the service with, or folks that were in their community, those folks are likely going to name the slaveholder. It's not going to be going around the bar four times and knocking and maybe I'll tell you. No, they're going to say, my former owner was this person and he lived here. Or my former owner was this woman and she lived here. You also might get the actual slaveholder giving a statement. Real talk, because they'll say Johnny ran away from me in about uh, August of 1863 to go and join the, the war or go and join the Union troops. Or they'll say, I've seen one. I inherited these enslaved from my father. So they're giving you two slaveholders in just that one statement. Right. The person who made the statement and then the fact that they acquired the enslaved from their parent. Now, Freedmen's Bureau. We could stay here all night long talking about this. The official name is the Bureau of Refugees, Freedmen, and Abandoned Lands. It was established by the War Department on March 3rd, 1865. If you know anything about timelines, 13th Amendment is ratified by the House of Representatives in January of 1865. Within two months, we have the Freedmen's Bureau, the official organization, is created. Now, there are certain places where the Bureau existed prior to this or iteration of it existed prior to this, but the national iteration was March 3rd of 1865, okay? It was also extended twice by acts in 1866 and 1868. If you are researching in Louisiana and Virginia in particular, that those states have pre what are called pre-Bureau records, meaning the apparatus that eventually became the Freedmen's Bureau, they have records that, again, are prior to freedom um, coming down. Now, the Freedmen's Bureau closed operations as of June 30th, 1872, although we see records that go later than this. What starts happening is because it's separated into field offices that are at the local level, there's a state level official, then there are people in Washington, D.C. at the federal level, what they started to do is they started to uh, close everything down is they would push everyone to a regional location. Like, let's say you're on the Mississippi Delta, everybody's stuff is going through Natchez or um, it's going through Jackson. And that's where you will typically see some of the later records. Now, with the Bureau, what did they do? A lot, okay? <laughs> this is the top level stuff, but it is not everything okay totally not everything look at how broad the definition is supervision and management of all matters relating to refugees and freedmen well wait a minute nika who are refugees yes that is not not a typo those are poor white people one of the things you need to understand about records for the enslaved and records for black people in the united states if there is it's much less likely that white people are not included in the collection 
Why? Because we were not able to read and write. So who's writing it down? So either they wrote it or they were a part of it in some way, shape, or form. So all matters, again, think of the name, Bureau of Refugees, that's, that's poor white people, freedmen, that's the formerly enslaved, and abandoned lands. The name is telling you everything. You could file complaints about race relations. Let's say somebody was uh, bothering you, doing something to you, you can report it to the Freedmen's Bureau. There are records on violence, racial violence. If you want to know about what was going on in the country during Reconstruction or right there after the Civil War, get a bird's eye view in the Freedmen's Bureau. Property that was abandoned or seized or confiscated during the war. Even people getting homesteads. If you're researching Florida, Florida had the highest number of homesteads issued by the Freedmen's Bureau than any other state. Abandoned or seized land, people who fought on the side of the Confederacy, their land could be abandoned or seized by the federal government. Or it's possible that they had these expansive plantations, the country would potentially go under or agriculture would go under if there was not tending being done to that land so that they would leave, the Freedmen's Bureau would lease the land out to keep it from going under. Labor contracts, that's probably going to be the biggest thing that we're going to be talking about. What are those? Go back to uh, General Gordon Granger's order for Juneteenth. It specifically says that the relationship from a uh, relationship between the formerly enslaved and their slaveholders goes to employee and employer. And how do you document that relationship? Through labor contracts. In addition to the contracts, the Freedmen's Bureau would also handle complaints and disputes over things like pay, all kinds of stuff. I have an ancestor who's um, the Freedmen's Bureau field office told them that they needed to bring their cotton to the head of the office in order for him to have it weighed, shipped to New Orleans, and then he would collect the proceeds and then give it out to the freedmen. Well, y'all already know that was a recipe for disaster because once that man got a hold of that money, he went and took it and was out here tricking and made it all the way from Louisiana to South Carolina. And they put out an APB for that man because he ran off with their money and my ancestor never got paid for that entire year's worth of work. How do I know that? Because the investigation was a part of the Freedmen's Bureau. More Freedmen's Bureau. Y'all thought that was the last slide. No, it ain't. No, it ain't. Mm -mm. Apprenticeships, what's that? If you had children and you could not afford to feed them and take care of them, you could apprentice your children out. And in some states, your former slaveholder got first preference on the apprenticeship. This also goes to children who were orphans. They could be apprenticed out. So in addition to facilitating those apprenticeship uh, agreements, the Freedmen's Bureau also dealt with complaints and disputes regarding apprenticeship. Uh, relief programs, like uh, things like rations and clothing, you'll find those records in the Bureau. The Freedmen's Bureau operated hospitals. Howard University Hospital was a Freedmen's Bureau hospital. Think about the name of Howard University. That name does not come from a black person. That comes from Oliver Otis Howard, the head of the Freedmen's Bureau. There are pieces of this all around us folks don't even know. Uh, there were contraband and refugee camps. Contraband, what do you mean? Those were formerly enslaved people who ran away. And, they, and in order for them to feel safe or like they were in better places than they were in, on their plantations, sometimes they would start following the Union troops. And they would they would establish what are called contraband camps because they were contraband, because they were property. Um, in fact, there's one that was maybe 16 miles from my house south. Um, in addition to that, schools, the Freedmen's Bureau operated schools. So there's school records. They performed marriages. They were over transportation of the refugees and the freedmen. Meaning you can find records in here where folks are taken from places in the upper south like Washington, D.C. and taken by train to the deep south to work on plantations that they didn't have a big workforce. So you might be looking at the 1870 census thinking, oh, my folks were born in Maryland. So that means that they must be brought here as enslaved people when it's possible the Freedmen's Bureau brought them there after slavery was over. Something to consider. Military. Freedmen's Bureau was over the U.S. color troops records for a while, okay, before we get the VA and before we get uh, uh, the iteration that we have now. 
So things like bounty payments, early pension records, back pay, you'll find those records in the Freedmen's Bureau. And of course, the operations, like I mentioned before, are available at what are called the field office, which is the local town, right, town or city. Then you have districts in certain states that are made up of several field offices. Then you all have states, and then you have stuff on the national level. Now, what's direct evidence that we can get of slave owners? The apprenticeships or the labor contracts. Those could be with someone's former slaveholder. That's often the first thing we look for is who was the landowner in this labor contract? Were they a former slaveholder? Do they have records? Do the, you know, is their family tree done? Can we look at who their parents were? When they died, did they have a probate or a will where the enslaved were left? And that, that way we can find the trail. Um, there are lists and censuses within the Freedmen's Bureau that literally have a field that says former owner. Someone going to get rationed, who's your former slaveholder? They would write that down. Um, in the complaints and letters and other statements, you'll find mentions of things like former slave of or former owner. Uh, with the labor contracts, you can also do a reverse kind of engineering and research the plantation name to see if it could be traced back to a slaveholding family. Because a lot of times what happened is that the uh, lands were abandoned, right? Slaveholders abscond. If you're talking like the area I do research in, a lot of those slaveholders left and went to Texas. And they have these abandoned lands. Nobody's there to work it. And so then here come folks from all over the nation, white folks who weren't slaveholding, who come in and lease the plantation, maybe potentially buy it, but they're not the slaveholder but they keep the name of the plantation. If you research the plantation name, you might be able to get back to the slaveholding family. And then additionally, um, there are documents that establish connections for your family during or right after the Civil War, which again could be a lead to who your potential slaveholder. Now, probation succession. What is this, okay? Probate, the literal definition, an official recognition and registration of a last will and testament of the deceased, administration of the estate of the deceased. A succession is the act or process of the estate um, of the deceased being assigned to their heirs. It's the same thing. We use the word succession in Louisiana, so I will pivot between both, but it's the same process, okay? Someone dies, they have property. Think about how you should be establishing a trust. Where does your property go when you pass away? All that stuff that people are doing today, they had been doing it. And you got to remember what property or what qualified as property well before the Civil War, it was enslaved people, which means that it could be captured within these documents. Now, if a person died with a will, they died testate. You'll hear this term used or you'll read it used within probate and succession records. But if they died without a will, they died in testate. So just think they in testate. Not testate. Intestate is without a will. What are the types of things that you can find in a probate or succession? Letters of administration, what is that? Let's say uh, someone passed away and they make Ife their uh, administrator, their uh, estate administrator. They are, she's the person that handles all the official business of the probate, meaning filing the taxes, making sure the property gets distributed to the to the appropriate people based on the will and the wishes of whoever the person is, okay? They had to issue approval to be able to do that on behalf of the estate. The will, the will, again, a lot of times, and, I, and those of you who are here who read through these as much as I do, and I see some of you all in here live, tell me if I'm wrong. Just about every slaveholder will starts out, in God's name for art thou, I commit my soul back to the earth and please pay my just debts and owe my beautiful wife and leave my girl Millie to my daughter. And you're like, wait a minute, you just went praising the Lord and then leaving people to other folks. That's what happens. It happens every single time. So the will is going to say, I leave my Negro woman so-and-so. I leave my Negro man, whoever, to my daughter or to my son. It's direct evidence. This whole thought process that people have that these records that document enslaved people, they, you know, they hiding this stuff. They ain't hiding this stuff. They were proud. And because they were proud, that's how you're going to find the names. Sometimes it'll just say my Negro slaves. And then you got to go pull things like an inventory 
that lists out all the property. If somebody died without a will, there's a higher likelihood that there's going to be an inventory of the property. Why? Because they have to quantify everything that they have. You are going to see the names of enslaved people across from dollar values. And it is going to piss you off. You're going to get mad. You're also not going to want to leave those people on those on those digitized pieces of paper because you're going to be concerned. What if their descendants are trying to find them? Now, the probate packet or folder, that's all the all the receipts for the estate. They could pay for things like medical care for the enslaved because slaveholders did that. Uh, they could pay. Uh, they could be it could be a receipt from another slaveholder where the estate of the enslaved hired the enslaved person out for an entire year and then received profits from that. All of that kind of stuff is within a probate packet. There are minutes that are associated with the, the probate, meaning what happened in court, so you can get a readout on that. Family meetings, this is probably one of my favorite things because I love to see when they got to fighting. Because they don't always get to fighting over the slaves. Somebody going to be mad they didn't get their right portion or, oh, they promised me this or they didn't value them high enough so they get to fight and they got to call a family meeting. And sometimes they have two and three of them until they can get to a consensus. And I'm like, this was just so just, y'all, we really didn't have to do this. And then you'll hear equity hearings. What is that? So equity means, well, my portion, I'm so we're all supposed to get an equal portion and mine is not that. Or I'm a wife and I didn't receive what I should have received from my husband's estate. Or there's a number of different things. The division of property, right? So let's say we settle up the estate. It calls for it to be sold. We got to divide everything up. That's telling you where everybody is going. So next to the feather bed, you might see the name of an enslaved person going to the to the enslaved, the deceased person's child. Um, more yearly and final settlement, right? So yearly settlement, meaning the estate is still open. Ife, as the administrator, has got to report out. Here's what I paid out. Here's what I received in um, when it's when it's finally settled. That's the last statement that gets filed. Again, direct evidence because they will name the enslaved. Not always, but most of the time they will. Now, for probates and successions, before 1865, the enslaved are going to be, not always, but a lot of the time, they're going to be enlisted in the wills of their slaveholders or included among the property in a probate or succession. Some slaveholders, though, never updated their wills. I've seen this so many times, you all. Trust me. You might be thinking, well, they died after slavery ended, so there's not going to be any slaves in their will. I've seen slaveholders drop dead in the 1880s. Ain't, ain't updated, not Nan updated the will and still got Negro man and Negro woman. And you like, why did you not go back? But then I'm like, actually, I'm not mad that you didn't go back to the courthouse because <laughs> you died after slavery ended. If you hadn't, if you kept your will, if you hadn't kept your will in the original format, I wouldn't know who your slaves were. So I'm, don't be mad they didn't update it. Be glad they didn't. So don't always think that they that they uh, that it's a lost cause if somebody died after slavery ended. All right, I know I'm moving quickly, but I'm trying to make sure that we get out of here on time, and I respect your time. So let's talk about how you get to these records. Now, the first thing for Civil War, right? We talked about 180,000 black men who fought as a part of the Union cause. You have to confirm that your person was actually enlisted to uh, to serve in the Union Navy or the Union Army. How do you do that? People are born between 1811 and 1848, okay? those That's the range of years that someone would have been born in order for them to be able to fight as a part of the Union cause. Additionally, you can look on the United States Census. There are two in particular that give you clues about service. The first is the 1890 veteran schedule. Now, you heard me last time I talked, talked about how the 1890 census was burned, partially burned and fired, and the Commerce Department said, oh, y'all don't need that. Let's finish burning the rest of it. So then they set the rest of it on fire, right? But the 1890 veteran schedule survives. And this is just for uh, former or for veterans and their wives or, you know, their, their spouses who are their widows. So if you are doing the work of genealogy, again, tracing from now back through the generations and you get back to this time period and you find somebody on the 1890 veteran schedule that you believe is your ancestor, this is a good lead. If that person or someone else survived to 1910, on column 30 of the 1910 census, there was a question asked about whether the person was a survivor of the union or Confederate Army or Navy. 
you'll see you see you'll see you a for union army you in for union navy that'll be a clue that that person was in fact a usct and if they live that long there's a higher likelihood that they applied for a pension now military records you're also going to pull up things like service cards how are you finding out this information? Service cards, you can find those on Fold 3 and you can find them also on Ancestry. The service cards list things, and you'll, there, you'll see an example of it a little bit later, where you'll get the person's birth date, where they are, uh, uh, their birth date or year, their height, their weight, um, where they were born. Sometimes on the service cards, they'll even tell you who the slaveholder was. And you're like, well, dang, why are they mentioning that? Because if the slaveholder allowed their formerly enslaved to go and enlist in the union, they got money. No, I didn't misspeak. If you were a slaveholder and you aligned with the union and you allowed your enslaved to go and enlist, the U.S. government paid you money for that. Now, uh, the pension cards, this is another thing that could be hinted on Ancestry. You'll see the name of the veteran. You'll see the name of the regiment that they were in. You'll also see maybe a widow's name or minor children's name that'll all pop up on that pension card. That's another thing that you need to look for. Confederate payrolls. Um, this is kind of an outlier. Again, we talked about body servants and folks serving with their former slaveholders. Um, but the Confederacy allowed people to hire their, hire their enslaved out and be compensated sort of in the same way. Same thing as I was mentioning, um, a slaveholder's estate hiring an enslaved person out and collecting the money from that. The Confederacy allowed their uh, populace to hire their slaves out and to do work for them and to be compensated for that. Um, now, remember, Confederate pensions, as I mentioned earlier, that's going to be with the states, okay? So whatever state the person was in, it's going to be there. Um, the other thing is, and you may find a lead to it if you research local records. If they may, it may tip you off that the person may have been um, involved with the Confederacy. But again, that's much less likely. You may have oral history. Um, that may be something that might have popped up in your family, right? Uh, maybe you have a photo. Maybe somebody mentioned um, this, that an uh, ancestor was an was an old soldier. Maybe you find a obituary that talks about them serving in the War of the Rebellion. All of those things can come up. I've seen it time and time again where folks don't know their ancestor was a part of the war effort until they find it in other places. Be prepared for name changes and aliases. And y'all are sitting here like, Nika, you just you have thrown us like 75 curveballs. We're trying to be the Los Angeles Dodgers right now. OK, we're trying to win this really quickly and easily. I get it. But here's the thing. It was a risk for them to go and enlist y'all. So sometimes they gave a different name because they didn't want the slaveholder to find them. So the thing is, a lot of times with the pension cards, it'll say alias and what the other name is. So you'll actually have both. So be prepared for that. Or even um, when I worked with Radio Lab with NPR and we were researching the reporter's family history. And I thought I had encountered, I, I, I pretty much I hit a brick wall and I was like, well, let me see, because we're dealing with Louisiana. And I found out that her ancestor was a US color troop, but he, he enlisted the name he was under was the wrong spelling. So it's fairly common. You can browse through the service records of a particular regiment or even um, the pension cards and look for other family members. A lot of times brothers or cousins would enlist at the same time. So there may be that one of the ancestors, you know, applied for a pension, um, but then the other did not, or maybe both of them did. But going through and browsing through the records, you might actually find some stuff that way as well. Now for the pensions, I'm letting y'all down easy. They are not digitized. That's the bad part, okay? They are not, all of them are not digitized. You are going to have to go on site or pay for someone to go and pull it for you from the National Archives. The services that I've seen used that most, a lot of us use are $50 a file. And if you go to the National Archives, which you can, they are in a years long backlog because of the pandemic. And their price is typically $80 a file. 
Now, the caveat to this is that there are some of these that are online. The National Archives catalog, they have them there. Full 3 has some of the files. The International African American Museum also has um, a certain amount. Most of those are from South Carolina because the museum is in South Carolina. And then you'll also have various websites where people have posted them like Reckoning.Inc. Um, it's a podcast and a nonprofit that specifically specializes in doing research on the enslaved in Kentucky. They have 500 um, Civil War pensions from the state of Kentucky on their website. You kind of find them. They're a hodgepodge. I'm sending out something into the ether that a I'm hoping maybe it's ja Rep. Jasmine Crockett. I don't know. We got two new black women senators. I need somebody to take up the mantle to fund this through the National Archives so we can get this stuff digitized because it's not just affecting us as black folks. It's anyone whose ancestors served on the side of the Union during the Civil War. And maybe just maybe we'll see. Maybe we can coerce them into doing this next year because of the anniversary. Maybe that's what it's for. Y'all let me know if you're going to join the effort, because, again, a lot of people's ancestors, their former slaveholders and their lives are hiding in these pensions. We just need a sympathetic ear of someone in Congress who can help push the stuff forward. All right. Now, the Freedmen's Bureau. Now, all of the Freedmen's Bureau is not indexed. I didn't say it isn't available. So sip the peanuts from the peanut shells. OK, it's not all indexed. OK, meaning type in a name and search. You can access the Freedmen's Bureau at Ancestry. It is free there. It is free at Family Search, where you can search by name and you can browse. The Smithsonian also has a project where they are trying to uh, transcribe word for word everything that's within the bureau records. And how many records are we talking about? It's 3.7 million names that are on Ancestry alone. Family Search has um, similar records, but it's a little bit less. There's additional indexing that's happened at Ancestry. The Smithsonian, the last time I checked, it was over a million images added to that site. Um, and they projected that they were going to complete the full indexing of the Freedmen's Bureau, literally full transcription, every word on the page in seven years. Now, if you want to visit the National Archives and look at on microfilm, feel free, but I'm pretty sure you want to save your eyes and you want to be in your pajamas when you do it. So. Just consider that. All right. Freedmen's Bureau, again, okay? My suggestion on this is search with name first, then location. Do not uh, be so fixated on drilling down to the well in your grandma's yard, okay? You got to control for certain things. What was the location and how was it recorded on the document? The name could have shifted. Um I, again, I would do name and then I would do state as opposed to a parish or a county. Um, that's just, again, that's just the way that I do it. For example, um, I found a whole bunch of records in Tennessee for Camp Nelson that's in Kentucky. And the reason why is the person that was over the Freedmen's Bureau in Tennessee was over in Kentucky. So somehow they bundled all the records together. Even though the information on the page didn't change, it just got cataloged that way. Um, the other thing is I've seen apprenticeships and labor contracts. Remember, apprenticeships, minor children, parents can't take care of them or they're orphans, right? Labor contracts between uh, former, formerly enslaved, former slaveholders or formerly enslaved and, and land leasing folks. Sometimes I've found those or iterations of them at the county or parish. So you may go into local records and see them. Um, and they may extend beyond when the Freedmen's Bureau happened because certain states, they had a law set up so that when um, slavery ended, they had to make sure that the formerly enslaved got paid and they, they made sure that it was predicated that they had to have contracts. All right, more information. Probates and successions, how do we get access to this? Here's the thing. There's a number of different ways, okay? Um, you can access them on Ancestry. You can access them on FamilySearch. FamilySearch has what I mentioned earlier is the full text search where they have trained a computer to read handwriting for wills and probates in the United States. And um, you can search for phrases, names, all of that stuff. But again, because the computer is reading it, that means that a human did not transcribe it or did not index it, which means that there could be errors or it may not be exactly what it is, okay? 
So I just issue that caveat. I would prefer for those of you who are beginning to start with um, searching for names only. Do not jump off on the deep end because it's very hard with a full text search. You don't know where you are. It just kind of drops you off because it's probate and it's deed records, meaning property transactions. You may not be experienced enough to know exactly where it drops, it off, drops you off. So I would suggest start, start with the Ancestry version, search by name there. If you're not having a lot of luck, and again, we're looking for slaveholders, you can look for the enslaved in both Ancestry and Family Search, but it's, it's sometimes it can be inconsistent. So um, you also have the ability to go to the state archives where your family lived. Um, it's usually at the state capitol, obviously. And then um, you can uh, go to your local county or parish website. All right. For probates and successions, again, the original records can be on site at your respective local county or parish or at the state archives. My suggestion, search all the indexes if you come across them. I've had scenarios where I used one index, but I came across two, and the record that I was finding in was in the second one because I thought the indexes were the same, and they weren't. It's not the case. Um, you can also search deeds and conveyances. I just talked about deeds. The enslaved may have been conveyed, meaning they may have been sold or gifted to a family member right before the slaveholder passed away. That happened quite often. So then when you got to the will and the probate, those slaves aren't, in, they are included because they're no longer the property of the deceased. All right, we have a few more minutes. I'm gonna get into a few examples just so you all can see how this works out because I want you to have the ability to have questions answered. All right, so in this example, this is from the Freedmen's Bureau. It's from 1873. This is a record for a man named Grannison Blackson, who was a part of the U.S. Colored Heavy Artillery um, and was born in Natchez, Mississippi. He actually um, died during his service. Um, he died on the 23rd of February, 1864. So he was only in the service from August of 1863 until February of 1864, which means that he technically didn't live to see freedom. But he still has a record within the Freedmen's Bureau. In green, you'll see it says no record of free or slave status. So there was nothing recorded down that talked about him being an enslaved person. Someone would consider this to be, okay, he died. So what are we going to find? He was a slave. He wasn't, he wasn't technically a person. What can you find? Well, that's not true. If you pull his service card, as I mentioned before, you're getting information like his age, his height, his complexion, eye color, hair color, where he was born, his occupation. It talks about him dying in the hospital in Natchez. So now we know where he died. But here's the thing. Within Grandison Blackson's records, with regard to his Civil War service, there is a pension and it was filed by his wife. So he had a wife when he went into the service. And within the file, his wife, her name was Angeline. <coughs> Excuse me. There was an affidavit of a man named Lewis Winston. And Lewis Winston was Grandison Blackstone's last slaveholder. In the affidavit, Lewis Winston says his uncle, Philip Hoggett, deceased, owned Grandison and Angeline Blackstone. So Lewis Winston's interviewed in 1869. He says he was the final slaveholder of Grandison and his wife, Angeline, and that he got both of them from his uncle. We got Three different last names we're working with. Lewis Winston, the last slaveholder. Philip Hoggett, Willis, uh, Lewis Winston's uncle. And then Grandison Blackstone and his wife, Angeline, got the last name Blackstone. Some of y'all are like, well, how in the world did they get the last name? We don't know. We don't care. We just got the slaveholder. How they got the last name is inconsequential. We just want to see Grandison, Angeline, the slaveholder family. That's it. So Lewis Winston mentions that on or about November 1855 is when he acquired them and when the enslaved were transferred to him by reason of demise of his uncle. So at this point, we're using a Freedmen's Bureau record that tells us that Grenison Blackstone died. We go and pull the pension, the pension for his wife that was filing it for him. And there's an affidavit from her slaveholder and her husband's slaveholder that tells us how he acquired them and the fact that he got them from his uncle. Now, we know the uncle died in, in 1855 you go and pull the uncle's estate. You get to the, the property. There's Angeline and there's Granderson. Listen, it's Anderson. 
Did I go around the barn four times? No, I didn't. I used one document. I read what everyone said. And then I used that to go to the next thing. Here's another example. Freedman's Bureau. Here's a letter from a woman named Mary Wilson of Fayette County, Kentucky, where she's giving a statement on June 17th of 1865. She states she was the wife of Lewis Wilson, who was in the 119th U.S. Colored Infantry, and that under the laws of Congress, she is entitled to her freedom, and that on or about the 31st day of May 1865, Superintendent Mason and Downey, policemen of the city of Lexington, came to her house in that city where she was living in an orderly and quiet manner and without just cause or provocation arrested her and forcibly and against her will took her to the residence of her former master, William Adams, living about three miles from Lexington, Kentucky, on the Newtown Pike. Now, how were they able to confiscate her? The 13th Amendment wasn't ratified by the state of Kentucky until 1976. So to them, slavery was still in, in, in action. So she chose to set herself free. Now, again, we got who her former slave owner was. If we pull her husband's service record, right, we get his. Why? Because his slaveholder applied to get money back from the federal government. That's within his file. So, James McKee, who was the slaveholder of Lewis Wilson, who was in the 119th U.S. Colored Infantry, he filed a claim to receive compensation for the value of Lewis. In his claim application, he noted that he purchased Lewis from John Waring in the year of 1846. So we just got two slaveholders, one for the wife and one for the husband because we found the initial record of the Freedmen's Bureau. And then we went from the Freedmen's Bureau to the service record of the husband who then his slaveholder filed for a claim. Now, we're gonna move to questions. Next, you would think, all right, let's go to the, the slaveholder who they named that they got them from, right? Which was John Waring. We should go to a probate. We should go to deeds. We should go to something else. But here's the thing. The records in that county burned in a fire in 1965. And some of y'all might think that this is helpless, but that's not the case. Luckily, the Historical Society has the originals. <laughs> so we didn't suffer a complete demise, okay? All right, I want to have time for questions. So let's go ahead and pivot, uh, Kim. Okay, thank you, Nika. That was a very informative and chock full of information presentation. I was taking notes. I'm like, good thing we have this recorded so I can go back because that's a lot of information. And we do have a question here. Um, but first, I wanted to ask you a quick question regarding this Freedman's information. I haven't had a chance to, you know, start looking at the, the Freedman database yet. Is there anywhere on any documentation that you've run across that identifies someone as a actual freedman, like on the census, would it say freedman? Would you see free freedman on any of these, um, you know, cards that you, you talk about, um, ID cards, right. anything of that so, nature? Yeah, so here's the thing. When you're talking about freedmen, sometimes in the Freedmen's Bureau records, you'll see acronyms like FMC, um, uh, you know, free, a uh, free, a uh, man of color, uh, you know, uh, uh, FMF, free woman or F FWF, free woman of color. Um, you'll see, um, they'll say freedmen, they'll use the term freedmen, uh, but don't conflate that with the five tribes and that definition of freedmen. That we're talking two different populations, okay? While the five tribes, Cherokee, Choctaw, Chickasaw, Muscogee, Freaking Seminole Nations, while they were slaveholding, and you do have the Bureau uh, in the Indian Territory, you do, um, the term freedmen for them is qualifying folks who were enslaved by folks who were part of those nations, which is separate from the Freedmen's Bureau, which was in several U.S. states. Um, and yeah, you will see the term, but it's not always applied. Um, it's, and so you, every record you see is not going to say John Friedman. It's not going to say that. Okay. But you may, if you do run across those acronyms, FMC, FWF, that may right. be an indication that they were involved in the Friedman. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for right. that Right. Sometimes if you see that. Yeah. Or, or again, it doesn't have to be the Bureau. 
that was a, just a common term used at the time. Okay. And maybe when there's more time, we can talk about if you have any thoughts about what's going on with the Freedman Bank being resurrected, um, you know, within this last administration. Um, yeah. Any any thoughts on that? Just really quickly, anything well, we Freedman's can do to Bureau, access it? Right. Freeman's Bureau, Freeman's Bank, separate entities. Again, uh, the bank had, had different operations. Those records are not well, and that's the thing on Ancestry, they're combined, like they're in the same overall collection, but they're different microfilm publications. So if you go to research those, like at the National Archives, the Freedmen's Bureau and the Freedmen's Bank, they're not in the same publications. For ease of searching across the two of them, they're in one collection on Ancestry, but it's not the same collection. Um, the bank, there are some incredible records there. Um, one of the things that I love about them is the, with the deposit slips, they have the next of kin. I've seen two and three generations of a family um, written down on these deposit slips, even family members who were sold away when they were going and creating accounts, they were putting on their mother, mother sold away in Virginia and they have her name or father sold away or brother died or um, here are my, the names of all of my immediate family, my children. I mean, I've seen some super detailed Freedman's bank records. Um, but they're not, again, just like how there's record keeping, there's differences from location to location. It's not always the same with that either. Even though it's a federal entity, not every card is going to have that level of depth. Unfortunately, it's not. Okay, that's very interesting. I can't wait to dive in. All right. So our first question we have here is from Shelly Viola Murphy. Um, would you like to unmute or let's see, do I need to unmute you? Hey, Kim, uh, this is Yamoy here. I'll try to go ahead and uh, bring her up. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay, Shelly, you can go ahead and unmute. There's no question. Thank you for an awesome presentation. Thank you, Shelly. Thank you, Shelly. All right. It looks like we have another question from a John Lattimore. Could you bring him up, um, Yamoya? Hey, can you guys hear me? Yep, we can hear you. Okay, yeah, I see that. Uh, first of all, thank you, Miss Nika, for your uh, presentation. I just looked you up on Facebook, and I see some, um, you're part of Ancestry.com, and, you know, I see some videos and some links from some things you've done in the past. I would like to know, um, how far can we go back as far as um, to the auction block, uh, maybe to the slave ship? Because um, I live here in Savannah, Georgia, and Savannah, Georgia was a, a port for the ancestors coming through, if you're aware of it. Savannah, Charleston, of course, James found Jamestown, Virginia. That's where the first one came through, 1619. But looking at here in the south, you know, deep south, uh, you know, Savannah, Georgia, and Charleston, how can we uh far can we go back? Are are you aware of that? Yeah, yeah. So um the I hate to answer, it depends. Um, you know, just as you you bring up ports that are well, you know, we're well aware of, like you mentioned, Savannah, Charleston, Jamestown. Don't forget about New Orleans. Um, mm -hmm. The fact that enslaved people were brought directly there um, from mm -hmm. Africa. Um, the thing about trying to get back to a slave ship is the complication is the, is the unstandardized record keeping. Um, for instance, you know, in my experience with my family, I have ancestors that were born before the founding of the United States. Um, that have African names. And I've tried to get back to the ship that they were on because I know they came into Charleston in the year 1806. Like I know that. Okay. But the transaction that documents that just says 12 Negro slaves. Right, right, right. And the person enslaved more than 12 people. Now we could assume based on the African names that they meant them and, and the fact that in the language of that receipt, it says 12 Africans. The mm -hmm. way that they delineated between um, folks that were fresh off the boat as opposed to people who had been here is they would refer to the folks that had been here and knew English, they would say Negroes. Right. If they were straight from Africa, they would say Africans. Right. So, like, oh, the, 
Africans. Right. You you uh you right. want to see an African, right. <laughs> right? Right, 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 right. Like you want yeah. right. So, so I'm referring back to that. between right. that. Right. right. So then the other thing is when you get to records where someone is born in Africa, sometimes they will just say born in Africa. They won't okay. tell you where. Um, oftentimes I've even looked at you know newspapers in Charleston to see mm. when they were bringing in shiploads of people and they would run an ad every every week until they sold everybody off the ship. There are early records in like Charleston, um, but every ship is not recorded. So mm. it's it kind of is, I don't want to say it's a needle in a haystack, but I think it's actually it's 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 like a both. You want to try and chase the paper trail as best as you possibly can. At the same time, those of us don't, have, so there are many of us who do not have clear paths to 1619. For me, that would be tracing back to, I think, tip great grandparents, and I've only gotten to my fifth. Mm. Um, so that's just, that's perspective, right? How many generations would it take you to get back to 1619? And again, for me, my fifth great grandparents, those are the ones that I just told you about who were born before the founding of the United States, that I'm almost 110% positive were trafficked here during the transatlantic slave trade. But even with them, I don't have, I don't have a ship manifest. I don't have any of that. So it's really all circumstantial. And it's really all depending on, again, just having the best case scenario in every, in every form of, of, you know what I mean? It's not impossible, but you are in for, you're in for a journey to try to do it. Oh, but man, you, you said something about African names. So when they, that's interesting. I would think that once you got off the boat, that ancestor got off the boat, you know, the slave master didn't care about your your name. They just said, okay, your name is Jenny or your name is John. Or, I mean, how, how do they document African names? I mean, because our ancestors didn't speak English. I mean, how do they write that down? I mean, I'm trying so to... So they, with, with this population of folks that I study, um, the elders, again, these are all people born before 1800, most of them born before 1776, almost all of them had African names. And I think it's because of the slaveholding family. These are people who were coming from Massachusetts down to Mississippi and Louisiana to make money on slaves and, and mm -hmm. cotton. So their ideology, they weren't Southerners yet. Their descendants were Southerners but they mm -hmm. weren't Southerners yet. So they retain, they allow them to retain those names. And there are people wow. still walking around being named Sago and Fatima now. And they might not even know where the name comes from. So it, it's all subjective, you know, to, to who the slaveholder was, what they would and would not allow. Um, but it is very, yeah, I, 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 in fact, I will tell you some locations like Louisiana, they were very um, intent on recording where somebody was taken from in Africa. There are certain places where you'll get to the transaction and it'll say somebody is from Congo or it'll say somebody is from Nigeria. It'll flat out tell you that. But other places, they'll just say Africa. So it all depends. OK, wow. So, um, when you look at Zora Neale Hurston, she interviewed Cujo back in um, the 1920s, 1930s. He mm -hmm. came out of... Uh, uh, present day uh, Nigeria. Yeah, I was there back in Nigeria back in February. I'm tracing my roots. Uh, so I'm pretty sure our ancestors are from there. Most of them are. I can see it. Mm -hmm. You know, I just got to. Right. The Nigerians told me I look like a Yoruba man. You know, based on these features, I get it all over without travel. So I got to look into that based on because you know features determine your quote unquote tribal group. So, but I'm pretty sure we mix. I'm mixed with different tribal groups. Of course, the European that mixture, but. I'm gonna right, I'm gonna right. I'm determined to look into this ASAP because I'm everybody yeah. I run Nigeria. You look at your people like okay, I gotta look into this. It's it's just saying something well, right here. Well, you yes. also have to think about again, it's multiple places in Africa, right? Where you have some that came from Nigeria, some that came from Ghana, some came from Senegal. Like, you know, this whole thought process that we only come from one tribe, that's not true. Right. We we right. are we are the biracial black people, if that makes sense. Like not by Most racial times. how you think of it from from a European right. sense, but from the from Africa, from West Africa, right. we are multi group. Um, right. Right. That's that's just that's just what it is. So the other thing I'll suggest, if you're interested in DNA, there are a lot of first generation African people like off the continent who are DNA testing, and they mm -hmm. are sharing DNA with those of us who are stateside in the Caribbean. And the only mm -hmm. way that happens is if. The, the DNA from the transatlantic slave trade survives all these generations down and is living mm -hmm. in us. Right. 
Yeah, I've seen uh, some people. One lady, she got her, she found a cousin from the Congo. Black Underwood found a cousin from Cameroon. Um, yeah, I'm looking at it. Yeah, I see that. You know, but I want to do a mix of records and DNA. I want to. I don't want to just right. jump to DNA. I want to look at records first. I want to challenge myself and kind of dig. You know, I like doing research and putting things together like a detective. Right. Mm -hmm. Yes. Well, thank you, John uh, Lattimore. And we certainly did get a abundance of resources to help us um, search in our genealogy. It doesn't look like we have any more hand questions, um, Nika, but there is a question in the uh, chat. Where to find the jurisdictions for the bureaus, field offices, the Freedmen bureaus? How do right. So them? there's a site that um, some of my good friends maintain called mappingthefreedmansbureau.com. And it has a map where you can go by state and drill down to where the respective field offices were. And you want to go to the one that's the closest to where your family lives. Now, I have a caveat to that because there always is with the bureau. Um, because of how the National Archives like put everything together. It's very like, you know, it's, it's groupy, if that makes sense, right? Things that they could assemble together very easily. There are a number of places that had field offices that were left off of the guides that kind of explain to you what everything is is, is doing and where, like what's going on. Um, we call them ghost field offices, but you don't know that they exist until you start going through the records. Thank you, Renata, for putting the link in the, in the chat. So if you want to know where the field offices were for the Freedmen's Bureau, use mapping the Freedmen's Bureau. That's an easy way for you to, to figure out where that is. Okay, and that um, information has been provided in the chat. So thank you, thank you for that. All right, well, it looks like that's all the questions that we um, have for this evening. Yamoya, I believe you were going to give us a quick update. Uh, you were streaming the New York reparations, the first in-person hearing. Uh, could you tell us how things are looking on the East Coast as far as reparations, how it's shaping up? All right, hopefully everybody can hear me. All right, um, so I'm just getting double, get off here. Okay, so as far as the New York reparations, they're having the first public hearing. They had it this evening. Um, if you have a chance, you can go onto our YouTube page at Emin the Mass Media Group. You can check it out there. Um, I believe it's their fourth or fifth official meeting. Prior to that, they had something called business meetings, uh, which way they would just focus on uh, business items at that particular time. But this is the first uh, public hearing in New York. And they're supposed to be having another one, I believe, in December. This one was in Buffalo, New York. And the next one, yeah, is in December 16th. I want to say that's in Queens. So if anybody is in New York and you are in the Queens area, um, you can go to, I believe, just type in the New York uh, Reparations uh, Commission, and you should be able to find more information on the next uh, hearing that's going to be in Queens, New York. That's about it. Thank you for that update, Yamoya. And if there's no other questions, Ashley, I will uh, pass this back to, to you. Thank you so much, Kim and Yamoya, for that great update. Thank you, Nika, for a wonderful presentation again. I got so many text messages from family and friends and people who are logging in um, saying how much they enjoyed this and how much we all learned from you. Um, can you see my purple slide up on the screen? Okay. I just wanted to just close this out tonight and um, share for those of you who don't know a little bit about the Black Reparations Project. Um, we are at Mills College at Northeastern University and also at UC Berkeley's Goldman School of Public Policy. And what we do is promote and create opportunities for individuals to come together, study, discuss, and learn about Black reparations. That's why we're talking about reparations tonight. And we see this work that we're doing about learning about genealogy and our ancestral roots definitely connected to the reparations movement. Um, this is our second workshop series. If you weren't able to join us for the first one, it was on beginning genealogy and family history. And we are um, going to be posting the recordings uh, for the series on our website, um, which I did put the link in the chat. 
Also, uh, our, our next and final workshop is going to be on February 11th. We kind of had to break it up um, with the school semester. So that'll be during Black History Month. And that will be on researching ancestral land. I encourage you to sign up for the last workshop and also share with your family and friends and encourage them to come. Um, <clears throat> we also have a repository of links if you're looking to learn more about what's happening right now across the nation as it pertains to reparations. There is a lot happening. Um, and here in California, um, as Emilia just told us about in New York, and so if you'd like to learn more about those things, I would encourage you to check out and explore our website. Um, and here's our contact information. If you are interested in partnering with us, uh, our email address is blackreparationsproject at neu.edu. And Ife, do you want to share a little bit about this upcoming event that we have on our campus for folks who are local? Yes, uh, thank you, uh, Ashley. And thank you so much, Nika. Uh, that was absolutely fabulous. I learned a lot. I'm so inspired. Um, and we will be having um, the last in what has been an amazing film series um, on the Mills campus in Oakland um, this coming Thursday. It is the third installment in our Bridging Perspectives film series, and it's going to feature uh, several short films. The first one is uh, called Champion. The second one is Broken Drawer. And then the third is My Own Mecca. Um, these are all uh, local filmmakers and women, I believe, women of color. And uh, they will be present to talk about their experiences, to talk about their films, to, to meet students. And um, you're, this is open to the public. So we want to encourage you to, uh, to check it out. You can go to the website, Mills Performing Arts, um, I think it's it's on the slide. I will actually put this in the chat in case you're interested. Um, but yeah, it's a fabulous series. It's part of our collaboration with the um, Oakland International Film Festival. And uh, David Roach, who's the founder, has been working with us. And we are excited about some um, future offerings that will uh, center stories that are not normally told, but stories that will be told. Um, by folks um, who are local to the East Bay, to San Francisco, to Oakland, to Berkeley, and so on. So um, we are genuinely honored and glad that everyone was here for this session. And again, many, many thanks to Nika for sharing so much amazing information. Um, I, I don't know how many books you've written. I think there must be another one you're probably working on. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Have a good evening. Have a blessed Thank evening. You.